Okay, I just. Okay, I guess it's being automatically recorded, but we'll cut out my intro later. <laughs> Welcome everyone. Uh, we're, we'll start in a couple minutes. Hi everyone, we have a ton of people um, still coming in. So we're just gonna wait one or two more minutes and then we'll get started. Um, but as you can see, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat and um, let us know where you're viewing from. Okay, um, why don't we get started? We have um, over 630 attendees in uh, this session and it keeps increasing, which is so great. Um, we're really glad to have all of you here with us. Um, we usually keep the conference really small since it's in person to 120 people. So this is, this is just great to see so many people interested and attending um, CLAPS this year. Um, okay, so um, feel free to keep introducing yourself um, if you'd like, and I'm going to get started. So welcome. This is the 2020 online version of the Critical Librarianship and Pedagogy Symposium. And I just realized I did not start my video. Unable. Okay. I think, Sophia, you have to stop 
your video for me to start. It doesn't matter. Anyway. <laughs> um, so, oh, close wait, it, but, so should I press stop? Um, no, you know what? It's, it's okay. I'll just keep going. I guess we're not going to have video <laughs> for right now. I don't know why. Okay. <laughs> Technical glitches. Okay. All right. Anyway, so I'm Nicole Pagowski. I'm an associate librarian at the University of Arizona Libraries, and I am part of the conference committee. So um, we have an intro slash welcome here, and then I'm going to introduce Sophia. Um, we have a decent amount of information to share. I'm going to try and keep it brief um, so we can get to the keynote. Um, but so that's what my slides are for. So first, we have a land acknowledgement. So the University of Arizona, and although this is virtual this year, um, we are giving the land acknowledgement for where the conference originated. So the University of Arizona sits on the original homelands of indigenous peoples who have stewarded this land since time immemorial. As an institution built upon the original territories of the Odom, we acknowledge the indigenous Sonoran desert communities past and present who have stewarded this region throughout generations. And um, we were thinking this year, instead of you know, just giving an acknowledgement, there's more that we could do. So we gave a couple suggestions on how you could give back. Um, so the first link is to the Tohono, Tohono O'odham Community College. The second link is to the Native American Advancement Foundation. Um, I'm sure a number of you have other suggestions, so feel free to add that in the chat if you have other ideas. Um, but here's just a couple options. All right. So a little bit about the Critical Librarianship and Pedagogy Symposium and reusing the hashtag CLAPS2020. So please use that um, on Twitter or elsewhere. Um, so this is the third year that uh, we've done the symposium. We started in 2016 and then we've done it every other year. Um, the funding is from the University of Arizona Libraries. Uh, it has made registration free um, every year. Um, so we're really thankful for that. Um, not just registration, but we've also done um, snacks and the social and other things in, in the years that we've been in person. Um, and then the University of Arizona iSchool um, provides two scholarships with preference to people from marginalized groups uh, to offset the cost of registration and just general attendance when we've done this conference in person. Um, and just to let you know, the chat is going really fast and I'm not looking over there all the time. so. Um, I might miss what you say, and we have another co-host in here who might be able to answer some questions if anything comes up. Um, okay, so capacity, like I mentioned previously, we've capped it at about 120 in previous years. This year, when we were going to have it in March, we were able to bring it up to 200. Um, but now that it's online, we have no cap. And we get this question sometimes, what is our acceptance rate for proposals? And it's approximately 35%. Uh, just briefly wanted to mention that we were honored to receive the ACRL IS Special Certificate of Recognition, recognition and Appreciation in 2019 for um, developing and organizing this conference. Okay. Um, the 2020 committee is Amanda Meeks, Yvonne Mary, Laura Miller, me, Jeremiah Paschke Wood, Anthony Sanchez, Mary Beth Slobotnik and Niev Wallace. And we also want to thank Nicole Hennig for web support. And we have a number of volunteers um, who will be moderating sessions and introducing speakers. And I do want to mention that at the University of Arizona, most faculty and staff uh, for this year through the end of the fiscal year have to take a pay cut anywhere between five to 15%, depending on your salary. And we in the libraries are all receiving this pay cut. Um, and through a lot going on on our campus and getting these cuts, we have worked so hard um, to not only organize the conference, but also to shift it. We planned everything to be online in March. Um, I mean, in person in March, and now it's all online. So I um, just want to acknowledge the work that the committees put in. Um, yeah. Okay. So we have a few types of sessions. Uh, we have general sessions. We gave uh, presenters flexibility so they could make their session whatever they want. Um, these will be recorded if the presenters consent and it will be announced at the beginning of the session. So if you enter a room late, you will get a notification that it's being recorded. We have lightning talks. These are grouped together 10 minute presentations with a lot of time for Q&A. Um, those will not be recorded. We have three invited talks, so two keynotes. And then we also have a facilitated session on peer review. The keynotes will be recorded. 
the facilitated session will not. And then we also have a number of activities. Um, so we have zine workshops uh, that have been organized with a showcase and happy hour. And please only register for the showcase and happy hour if you are involved in doing the zine workshops. And then we have three happy hours for everyone else um, dispersed throughout. The first two are more of a social type of thing. And then the last one is a book discussion. And you must register for all of these through the website. There's a link. In the schedule, you'll see some sessions have a pre-recording to view before the synchronous session. Um, so that means they're taking kind of a flipped classroom approach. So they want you to view something before and then the synchronous session is being used for discussion or a workshop or other activities. And that um, is so the conference can be as interactive as possible, even though we're online and all spread out. And then we have our keynotes, which we are so excited for. I will be introducing Sophia in a little bit. Um, and I also just want to remind everybody about um, Dr. Cabrera's closing keynote. Um, that's Thursday, the 17th. It's 1 to 2.15 p.m. our time. Um, and I know that's been confusing for people. Um, I'll just clarify that we do not change our clocks in Arizona. So when you all move your clocks ahead, we get bumped back to Pacific time. And then when you move your clocks back, we get bumped forward to mountain time. So right now we're the same time as California. I hope that clarifies that. Um, so Dr. Cabrera is an associate professor in the Center for the Study of Higher Education at the University of Arizona. And um, hopefully you'll all attend the closing keynote as well. And for extra incentive to join us, um, we will be having a book raffle for Dr. Cabrera's book, White Guys on Campus, Racism, White Immunity, and the Myth of Post-Racial Higher Education. This information I think is being added to the site as we speak, so you can enter for free. Um, and I'm not sure when it closes, but I think that will also be posted on the site. Um, and then the book discussion follows immediately after Dr. Cabrera's closing keynote. All right, so then we have a peer review facilitated session. Um, and this year we revised <clears throat> our peer review and selection process and we thought changing from open, which we had done in the past, to blind this year would create more equity and selection and also um, offer more prestige for anybody who's putting together a packet um, and they would be selected for the conference. Um, but what we realized was that we were choosing proposals, you know, once we matched up the names with the sessions we chose, um, from people who had a lot of experience and previous opportunities to present. And if these people submitted uh, more than one proposal, we realized that we were choosing both. So we wanted to make sure we were giving opportunities to new scholars. And we also wanted to make sure that there was not implicit bias in our selections. So our guess was if we were falling into this pattern, that that might have an effect on who we were selecting. So it wasn't a scientific process on trying to investigate people's race, race or ethnicity. Um, it was a guess that this could be happening. And so we decided we just didn't want to go there and instead made the process open um, as we had in the past and we just started over from scratch. Um, so we feel confident that, you know, we ensured that we have good representation at this conference. Um, and I'll say it was tricky and messy and anxiety inducing and created double the work for us, but we really tried our best to make it better um, to the best of our current knowledge and ability. Um, and we've tried to be as transparent as possible about that. So the purpose of having this session uh, is to discuss issues related to peer review, such as the issue that we've had. It's not just about this. Um, so it'll be led by Emily Ford, who has devoted much of her research to this topic. So please join us on September 3rd for the discussion to participate. And again, that one won't be recorded. It's just a discussion. All right, our code of conduct. Let me make that a little bigger. Um, so our, our code of con conduct is focused on anti-harassment. So we have a stance of we believe. We believe Black and Indigenous people of color and those from marginalized groups. We assume belief as the basic agreement and don't question or play devil's advocate with others' experiences. For social and recording, um, again, our hashtag is CLAPS 2020. But if you're in a session and presenters request um, that their session is not to be captured, um, whether it's shared notes or tweeting or recording, please respect that. The Q&A sessions, uh, please be respectful and do not dominate the Q&A with comments under the guise of questions. I'll talk a little bit more about this right before introducing Sophia. 
And we believe timekeeping as feminist praxis. So keeping time is a feminist issue um, and we need to have fairness and time to speak. So we ask uh, presenters to keep track of time, but also participants if you're asking a question or talking. Um, and we encourage presenters who feel like the code of conduct has been violated in their session to shut it down and or the moderator will help enforce that. Um, typically, everybody has been great in previous years, but since we're online and a lot more people have registered, there's a greater chance. Um, so we urge an approach of calling in before resorting to calling out. Then this housekeeping stuff, um, this is kind of just a recap of what I've already talked about. So just don't forget, if you want to go to a session, you need to register for each one um, through our website and you'll get the Zoom link. And make sure you check if there is a pre-recorded portion um, for that. Um, again, with sharing, we have our hashtag. I mentioned the happy hours. You need to register for those as well. Um, we talked about our presenters. Um, with accessibility, captioning or transcripts will be made available for most sessions. And then the recordings will be through our repository um, afterwards. And the ones that have pre-recordings either um, have captioning or some sort of transcript or, or written um, component. And then we um, made the schedule really flexible this year since we're online. Um, it's really hard to sit on your computer for hours straight and also have the stress of choosing between which sessions you wanna go to. So we spread it out over three weeks and gave presenters the choice of which day and time they wanted within that three weeks. Um, and if there are consecutive sessions, we have 30 minute breaks between those sessions. So uh, hopefully that works well for people. All right, so um, we're really glad to have you all here with us right now. We're at 728 people in the session, which is really great. Um, <clears throat> so you can contact us with questions or issues at our email address here, uh, collapseconference at gmail.com. We have our website, again, our hashtag. Um, and before I introduce our opening keynote, I know everybody's really excited, um, but I just want to do a little housekeeping here. So, um, so just so you know, so that we could accommodate a large number of, of people, we needed to change the Zoom room to a webinar. So that means everyone is automatically muted and with no video aside from the speakers. Um, and then there is a Q&A function along with the chat box. You might have seen it. Um, so questions will be taken at the end of Sophia's talk. And please, if you have a question, only put them in the Q&A box so that we can keep track. Um, if you put them in the chat, we're most likely gonna miss them. Um, so make sure that you do that. And Sophia will have more information about how the Q&A session will go. Um, and then we appreciate um, Dr. Eve Tuck's approach to a Q&A, a successful Q&A, where she recommends giving people time to talk with their neighbor after the session to reduce uh, problematic questions. Um, so she puts, did you peer review your question to the audience before opening it up? Now here, we don't have the option of turning to a neighbor. So perhaps using the chat box as the keynote is going can serve this purpose well. Um, so with that, keep the following in mind that she highlights. So one, is this really a question? Two, are you implying that you should have given the talk instead? Three, does the question need to be asked and answered in front of everyone? And four, is the question asking the speaker to do a lot of work where they have already done a lot of work that the question asker should be doing themselves? Okay, so immediately after the keynote, we have a happy hour and hope you'll join us. That's one of the social ones. Um, everyone will be broken up into groups and you get to choose an activity. We have some suggestions. So um, it should just be casual and fun. Um, and then the slides I presented here will be available on our website for reference later. Okay, so I'm gonna, wait, we already are recording, aren't we? Amanda, do you mind checking and if we aren't recording? Um, we'll start now. Um, okay, so um, we're gonna get to our keynote and I am so pleased to introduce uh, Sophia Learn as our opening keynote this year. Sophia, who uses the pronouns she, her, is a librarian, facilitator, and educator offering tailored workshops, training, and consultations that employ anti-racist, anti-oppressive frameworks, in particular, critical race theory. She is currently an editor for the We Here publication, Uproot, and a facilitator for the Association of College and Research Libraries Information Literacy Immersion Program. Her co-edited book with Jorge Lopez McKnight, Knowledge Justice, Disrupting Library and Information Studies Through Critical Race Theory, will be published by the MIT Press in April 2021. So we are honored to uh, welcome Sophia and I'm gonna turn it over to you to start talking. 
Great, thank you, Nicole. Um, let me just share my screen now. Can everyone see that? I'm also not going to have chat open, so after I check, make sure you can actually see it, <laughs> just so I don't lose track of where I am when I'm talking, because I'll be easily distracted by all the flashing words. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I've seen a lot of friendly faces, well, I mean names, in the chat, and I really wish I could see you in person, but here we are. I hope you're all doing, hope you and yours are all doing as well and staying as healthy as can be in these chaotic times. And I wanted to thank you for joining me and taking time out of your day to listen to my talk. I hope you find it worthwhile. And just as an FYI, I've turned my camera off for privacy and safety reasons. I also wanted to thank the CLAPS committee Yvonne, Nicole, Amanda, Laura, Jennifer, Jeremiah, Anthony, Maribeth, and Neam for inviting me to speak and organizing this symposium, particularly because of the difficulties involved in planning it this year. And I also wanted to thank Lori for helping me on the administrative side. Oh, and before I get to the meditation, um, you're welcome to tweet out this uh, talk. It's going to be recorded anyway, so feel free. Um, so I just like to start with a short meditation to help ground us in this virtual space and time. So if you'll join me in doing this, plant your feet firmly on the floor, close your eyes when you're ready, take a deep breath in and let it out slowly. Let go of the moment before and settle into this moment. Feel yourself pulling energy up from the earth beneath you. If it's helpful, you can visualize it as a glowing light. Feel the lighter energy spreading up your legs, up the front of your torso, up your back. Feel it in your shoulders and down your arms. through your neck, up through your face, behind your eyes, and up through the top of your head. Take one more cleansing breath and let it out slowly. When you're ready, open your eyes. Um, so as Nicole mentioned, we're not actually in all in Arizona. So I'd also like to um, do my own light acknowledgement. I'd like to offer gratitude to the indigenous peoples who cared for the land I am on today. I'll give a little map. I am on the unceded ancestral territory of the Massachusetts and Wampanoag peoples and which is still home to many Native American people, including the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe. I also want to acknowledge the free people forcibly kidnapped from Africa in order to be enslaved on these lands. And as a Chinese American settler and guest, it's important for me to acknowledge the history of violence, disease, and genocide that led to the colonization of this land and my eventual inhabitants of it. And one thing I've been thinking about with regard to this is how to behave as a settler and guest on these lands. And I'd ask you to do the same for the lands that you are settlers and guests on and how you might behave. And this slide is by no means the first or last word on land acknowledgements or what it means to be a settler on these lands, but just more as a starting point or a continuing point um, wherever you are in your journey. And I particularly want to call your attention to the fact that the United States government is continuing its legacy of forcible removal and hostile actions with a complete disregard for the sovereignty of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe. And this is the same tribe that welcomed the pilgrims in the 1600s, and it's at risk of losing what is left of their homelands due to a determination made by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So please join me um, in showing up for the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe by signing their petition asking Congress to protect its reservation lands 
and support the Mashpee Wampanoag Tribe Reservation Reaffirmation Act. Um, and that's the last link in the resources side of this slide, which I'll make available later. And now I'd like to take a moment of silence for Leilene Polanco, Dominique Remy Fells, Rhea Milton, Priscilla Slater, Brianna Taylor, and Brayla Stone, who lost their lives because of anti-Black violence and racism. We must demand justice for them while also ad advocating to abolish prisons and defund the police, particularly as libraries often function in concert with the police to endanger the lives of Black people in those spaces. So you can find out more about how to do that um, by following the links on this slide. And the talk I'm sharing with you today is still a work in progress. And just a heads up that we'll definitely be dealing with some heavy violent topics today, like racism, white supremacy, settler colonialism and colonization and how we're complicit in those systems. So some difficult feelings and discomfort might arise and I just want you to be aware of that before we get started. And as I'm speaking, I realize because of this format, attendees can add their questions in at any time. So I'd like to provide some guidelines on that before we get started. And at the end of the talk, when you're, when we actually, I start answering those questions, I want to use a method um, that I learned about from Ozzy Alozium called progressive stacking. And this means that I'll be prioritizing questions from black indigenous and people of color. And I will be answering those before I answer questions from white folks. So in the Q&A, please identi self-identify as BIPOC when you add your question in. You can just like do it in parentheses or something before your question. Okay. So for this talk, I've borrowed the title from the forthcoming collection that I co-edited with Jorge Lopez McKnight that will be published in spring 2021 from MIT Press. And much of this talk was influenced and inspired by the work of the 28 amazing contributors to that collection. Um, and I want to thank, thank them here now. Miranda Blardy Lewis, Jennifer Brown, Anastasia Chu, Nikolai Klein, Anthony Dunbar, Ann Cohn uh, Hewen, uh, Isabel Espinal, Fobazi Itar, Jennifer Freddy, April Hathcock, Todd Hanma, Harrison Inofuku, Sarah Costalecki, Kalfi Kumasi, Suhei Lugo, Marissa Mendez Brady, Myrna Morales, Lalitha Nataraj, Avani Natarajan, Antonia Alabas, Kush Patel, Tori Quinones, Maria Rios, Tanya Sutherland, Chandra Walker, Stacey Williams, and Rachel Winston. And my biggest thanks goes to my frequent collaborator and my brother from a different mother, Jorge Lopez McKnight, who helped me figure out what this talk needed to be. Okay, so let's do this. Um, how often do we acknowledge our identities, positionality, and privileges, and how they color our perspective, work, or interactions? I was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. I am the daughter of immigrants. I'm a Chinese American. I'm a heterosexual, cisgendered, able-bodied woman who no longer works at an institution, but still relies on institutions for my employment. And it's important for me to acknowledge upfront and immediately my identities and for you to know that, that my perspective is specific to my identities um, and where I have privilege. Okay, I'm just gonna take a sip of water here. So what I'm gonna talk about today, I'm using a set of questions to explore the responsibility that library and information studies has to the so-called public good the stated value of librarianship. What power and agency do library and archive workers have over knowledge? How has LIS created and maintained systems of oppression such as white supremacy, colonialism, and racism? And how does this impact Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities? Why is the experiential knowledge of BIPOC critical to imagining and building liberatory futures? And finally, what is our obligation to ourselves and our communities to disrupt and destroy the systems of oppression within LIS? So let me start with a counter story about why 
knowledge justice is necessary. For those of you who may not know, a counter story is a critical race theory tool for exposing, analyzing, and challenging the majoritarian stories of racial privilege. So at the last institution I worked at, I gave a workshop on applying social justice and critical race theory to artificial intelligence. After the workshop, a graduate student, a white man, came up to me with a question. During the workshop, he had said that he worked on rockets, which in his mind had nothing to do with people. And I was a little taken aback when he said that, because of course rockets have to do with people. People build those rockets to serve human interests. Rockets can be used for many people-related activities, fireworks, and I also had to look this up because I was like, what else are rockets used for? Uh, weaponry, weaponry to be used on other humans. Rockets can be used to launch satellites into space to surveil people. And let's not be totally ignorant of where the money to fund this research comes from. This institution was and is heavily funded by the US Department of Defense, and they for sure care about building the rockets. Okay, but back to the student, he was determined to inform me that his particular field believed in and cared about meritocracy. Now, real talk, it was almost 7 p.m. on a school night, so how much time did I really want to spend on educating this white dude on history he should have learned that we should have learned in school? And where to even begin? Did he know that NASA spent $25.4 billion in 1973 dollars on getting white men to the moon when African Americans were advocating for economic justice? That the U.S. nation state had decided that white vanity was considered more valuable than black humanity? to paraphrase CRT scholar George Lipsis, and that the United States has done this over and over throughout history. And honestly, this whole incident really shocked me because I mean, I know that our education system was and is highly flawed, but I really didn't recognize how badly. On a really basic level, by repressing certain stories from our history, by never telling those stories, never even mentioning that they exist, Things that should be obvious, like what rockets have to do with people, become obscured, inconceivable, or abnormal. And aerospace engineering isn't the only discipline where its historical, social, economic, and political context has been ignored and erased. In 1975, Toni Morrison gave a speech detailing the ways in which history, the social sciences, and the humanities have established their profound ignorance around race. I want to give special thanks to Keisha McKenzie for their transcript of the speech that I'll read from now. Any one of those studies, history, the social sciences, and the humanities, if it was honest, would acknowledge that the majority part of history in this, that the major part of history in this country is the history of the minorities and the pe Black people in it, and how they influenced those who were first, and how they influenced each other. And yet we know that that is not what history, the social sciences, and the humanities have been about. And Morrison goes on to say, the economic history of this country is, among other things, the study of generations and generations of free labor used to make the country grow. And the legal history of this country is very heavily weighed with the courts, particularly the Supreme Court's relation to Black people, and the legislation designed specifically, deliberately, to keep them oppressed. So there is a purpose and intention behind obscuring these histories, these knowledges. These disciplines are serving the purpose, the intention of a system of white supremacy, which is a foundational organizing principle of this country. I'm just gonna grab some more water. Francis Lee Ainsley defined white supremacy as a political, economic, and cultural system in which whites overwhelmingly control power and material resources, conscious and unconscious ideas of white superiority and entitlement are widespread, and relations of white dominance and non-white subordination are daily reenacted across a broad array of institutions and social settings. White supremacy uses politics, economy, and culture as tools to hold on to power and wealth. Much of this control comes from these conscious and unconscious ideas that white people are superior and therefore entitled to certain privileges, and chief among them legal rights. 
white supremacy wants to forget that the histories and knowledges of black, indigenous, and people of color ever existed. It requires the erasure of these knowledges to operate. It wants us to believe that white superiority and entitlement are right and true, that white, whiteness equals neutrality and objectivity. And it wanted that grad student to think that meritocracy truly existed in his field, that his work had nothing to do with people and therefore nothing to do with racism. White supremacy masks how everything is connected in order to hide and protect its power. If you don't know how far its control extends, then you can't dismantle it. So what does this have to do with library and information science? Well, let's think about why is our field a science in the first place? From what I was taught in my LIS program and from what I've experienced as a librarian, I'm still, I still have yet to discover what our field has to do with science. And when you think about what the word science conveys, it often makes you think of something objective or systematic. It deals in facts and reason, subjectivity and value judgment have nothing to do with it. The discipline chose to disguise the very subjective nature of this field with a label of science to signal the very opposite. LIS was created to uphold white supremacy to keep power for wealthy whites as an institutional tool for white supremacy. And this is just the first move white supremacy makes towards obscuring the real power LIS holds over this thing we call knowledge. LIS extends this obscuration by establishing that librarianship fundamentally values the public good and in doing so has an institutional responsibility to the American public. Under the public good, the American Library Association states that re it reaffirms the following fundamental values of libraries in the context of discussing outsourcing and privatization of library services. These values include that libraries are an essential public good and are a fundamental institution in de uh, democratic societies. So for libraries to be a public good, that would mean they provide, um, quoting from Oxford's English Dictionary, a service without profit to all members of a society, either by the government or by a, a private individual or organization. And yet we know this does not happen indiscriminately. Many others have written about historical and more recent events where Black people have been forcibly kept from entering libraries or using library services. So what's the service a library provides that's so special that causes library workers to commit violence against Black folks? Let's look at the ALA, at ALA statement about public good again. Libraries are fundamental institutions in democratic societies. So libraries are presumably fundamental to democracy. And it turns out democracy is also one of LA, ALA's core values of librarianship. So let's look at that definition. A democracy presupposes an informed citizenry. The First Amendment mandates the right of all persons to free expression and the corollary right to receive the constitutionally protected expression of others. The publicly supported library provides free and equal access to information for all people of the community the library serves. So the library is supposed to provide free and equal access to information for all people. It is an educational resource. Public libraries are supposed to help keep the citizenry informed. And that's part of what we, including Black people, pay taxes for. But if libraries are keeping out Black folks, logic here would say that, that libraries don't want Black people to be informed. They don't want them to be a part of a democratic society. And as a fundamental institution in American society, libraries are operating as a tool of the American government to help the white supremacy project of disenfranchisement. They're just not saying it explicitly. And libraries have always been good at hiding behind their supposed neutrality by stating that they care about access for all and intellectual freedom, while at the same time serving the interests of racial domination. I'm paraphrasing Gary Peller's words here, that institutions claim to be neutral and objective, which allows them to exert a power over people. In order to be seen as neutral and objective, LIS has to hide what it is doing, what it is erasing. White supremacy requires these conditions to thrive, to maintain its system of control. Again, there is a purpose and intention behind obscuring these histories 
these knowledges. In my LIS program, and I assume this must be the case across the majority of LIS programs, we were never told how libraries have contributed to the harm experienced by communities, communities of color. We were never told about the Tugelo Nine. We were never told the profession is 88% white. We were never told how many librarians of color end up leaving the profession. So how many other things were we never told? What LIS loves to do instead is tell stories of how libraries level the playing field. They provide access to all. They're here for the public good, for democracy, for social responsibility. They use core values of librarianship to disguise LIS's power and agency over knowledge. But what have we been told knowledge is? Let's look at this definition from Miriam Webster. The sum of what is known, the body of truth, information, and principles acquired by humankind. The body of truth, information, and principles. Whose truth, whose information, and whose principles? What is knowledge but stories that we have told ourselves, each other, repeatedly throughout time that we call truth? To uncover what stories LIS has told over and over in the service of both white supremacy and what Myrna Morales and Stacey Williams call epistemic supremacy, which they define as a political ideology that facilitates, enables, and upholds the conditions that lead to the destru destruction of communities of color, particularly working class and poor black and indigenous communities. We as library workers need to be asking ourselves the following questions. Whose stories get to be told? Whose identities, histories, and truths matter? Who gets to tell those stories? And who ensures that those stories are considered knowledge? Who selects these stories for our collections? Who determines what these stories are about so that they can be found? Who determines what access to these stories look like? And who determines who gets that access? Our responsibilities as library and information workers means that we collect knowledge, catalog it, and organize it. We teach people how to access it, control access to it, decide when it's time for us to weed it out because no one's using it. To pay for the privilege of housing that knowledge, we use questionable funding sources at the cost of black and brown lives through the prison industrial complex, the military, the spoils of war, and gentrification. And most importantly, we help decide what's considered knowledge, what the value of that knowledge is, and whether it's important enough for us to have in our collections. Knowledge is created, validated, stamped as truth by the oppressors, and we have filled our physical spaces with it. By selecting what we consider to be worthy enough to be in our collections, we've also signaled what and who are not worthy to be in our collections and in our spaces. Another quick sip of water here. A CRT scholar, Gary Peller, has said, knowledge and reason are functions of power. Under white supremacy, knowledge is the written word, and the written word is the realm of the white men who have gotten to go to the right schools with the right education to get the right credentials to write up that knowledge. And we are told that knowledge is represent, uh, representative of humankind, objective, neutral, and factual. And the way that we treat knowledge in libraries and archives upholds white supremacy beliefs and perspectives. Items in our collection are treated ahistorically and history is seen as linear. Events are often seen as disconnected and as individual moments in time. This is not a coincidence. The way we think about knowledge is heavily influenced by enlightenment ideals and Western white cultural ideas. Knowledge as we know it represents the dominant hegemonic culture. Grossfogel argues that the, con the canon of thought in all the disciplines of the social sciences and humanities in the Western University is based on the knowledge produced by a few men from five countries in Western Europe, Italy, France, England, Germany, and the USA. That basically their theories are considered universal enough that all we need are their theories to explain the social and historical realities of the rest of the world. When we take for granted what has come to be known as knowledge without question, we are buying into one of white supremacy's major objectives, to view knowledges that present any other perspectives as inferior. 
But of course, that all goes out the window once white folks, quote unquote, discover Black, Indigenous, and people of color knowledge that they want to claim as their own. Indigenous scholar Linda Twy Smith wrote, it appalls us that the West can desire, extract, and claim ownership of our ways of knowing, our imagery, the things we create and produce, and then simultaneously reject the people who created and developed those ideas and seek to deny them further opportunities to be creators of their own culture and own nations. When BIPOC knowledge is included, it's often not written by BIPOC themselves. We don't get to tell our own stories or share our knowledge on our own terms. Here, let me introduce whiteness as property, a CRT concept that Cheryl Harris conceived of, where she argues that whiteness was constructed in order to justify subjugating Black and Indigenous people and then using whiteness to retain and secure power for white people. Harris defines whiteness as the right to white identity as embraced by the law, is property. If by property one means all of a person's legal rights. White folks enjoy the right to own their identities, to tell their own stories, and by extension, use, enjoy, and tell the stories of people who don't have the privilege of being white. BIPOC knowledge is only worthy if white people tell it, never mind the fact that it was never theirs to tell in the first place. Miranda Bellardi Lewis uh, of Zuni and Clinkett and Sarah Kostelecki, Zuni Pueblo, make this very clear in their chapter. Research by outsiders has resulted in the publication and dissemination of ancient sacred knowledge, esoteric traditions and religious practices without free prior and informed consent of Zunis. The information and knowledge collected was not the author's information to share or the readers to know. Not only is it not the author's information to share, but it's certainly not the author's to own. And yet we have a whole system of legal restrictions to protect that ownership. Intellectual property law in the US, which comes from the British system of granting monopolies to authors and inventors, protects commercially valuable products of human intellect as defined by Black's Law Dictionary. IP has become a way for white people to take the knowledge and culture from BIPOC, claim it as their own, and prevent the black and brown creators from receiving credit or profits. And there are plenty of historical and current examples of this that you can easily find. History scholar Kurt Newman provides the example of swing era band leader Paul Whiteman, who is famous for many reasons, but in this case, for propertizing the resources of African American musical innovators, as Newman puts it. Okay, so what does the ALA Code of Conduct say about IP? We respect intellectual property rights and advocate balance between the interests of information users and rights holders. That really explains so much about this profession. It sounds like ALA respects the people, the people who laid claim to the knowledge as property, not the people who that knowledge came from and who it actually belongs to. And nor does it seem to advocate for the balance between who gets to benefit from intellectual property rights and who doesn't. And let's remember, this is a document that is supposed to codify the ethical responsibilities of this profession. To help maintain these white ideas of knowledge, LAS has erected barriers of entry to those who want to join its ranks. You need to get into a bachelor's and then a master's program, which both use standards not meant to be met by black and brown folks. You need wealth to pay for those programs and we already know how hard it is to get loans for black and brown folks. You have to survive those programs which were not built for you and which operate on white supremacy culture char characteristics meant to tear you down. And then you gotta get a job, which again is based on white standards of what is considered experience, knowledge, and professionalism. Once in that job, you're expected to keep your head down, not rock the boat, continue doing the things the way they've always been done just be fucking grateful that you got a job at all. So once we finish funneling through the system, what do we have to believe constitutes knowledge? Black indigenous and people of color have had to learn to survive in a culture, a system that does not want us there. We have never been seen as neutral or objective. Our knowledge and perspective is always considered subjective. We have been told in lots of little and big ways that the very knowledge we have inherited from our families, 
our ancestors is not important. It's lesser than the knowledge we learn in the US education system and from the LIS profession, that our experiences BIPOC don't matter and that no one wants to hear our stories. So what have we sacrificed in order to survive in a white supremacy system? What stories and knowledges have we lost? Gross Fogel defines what de Sosa Santos calls epistemicide as the extermination of knowledge and ways of knowing. How much epistemicide has LIS contributed to? And that's a question we'll never have the answer to because answers have been systematically erased. By only centering knowledge that reaffirms whiteness norma whiteness's normativity, LIS has disrupted the knowledge passed down through BIPOC generations. So not only is material generational wealth almost non-existent from BIPOC, but cultural generational wealth and knowledge have been diminished thanks to slavery, colonization, settler colonialism, racism, and forced assimilation. And is this really the legacy that LIS wants to continue to contribute to? LIS has been telling a very specific story. It's a story of white racial dominance, a story about whose knowledge matters, about who is even considered worthy to collect that knowledge, a story about who gets to count as human. This is how LIS advances white supremacy and epistemic supremacy. This is how we as a profession are connected to the very same violence I asked you to take a moment for, of silence for at the beginning of this talk. And sure, we didn't create those systems, but by not recognizing how we're continuing to support and maintain them, we are complicit in them. We cannot continue to pretend towards the ideals of the public good and social responsibility while at the same time causing harm to communities of color, to the people of color within our profession. We have to pay attention to what white, white supremacy doesn't want us to pay attention to. We have to make explicit what white supremacy has been trying to conceal. For LAS to move towards the racial justice we demand and deserve, we need BIPOC knowledge, stories, histories, and most important, imagination. When you have only one version of things, one perspective of the world, your imagination is limited. The graduate student in my story could not envision how his work impacted people, partially because he lacked the historical knowledge and experience of BIPOC. Our experiences illuminate where the points of racial domination intersect those of sexism, homophobia, transphobia, ableism, and other forms of subordination. Intersectionality, coined by CRT scholar Kimberly Crenshaw, was conceived of to describe this exact thing. For BIPOC to share our knowledges and our experiences is to challenge the very foundations of white supremacy. Walida Amarsha wrote, for those of us from communities with historic collective trauma, we must understand that each of us is already science fiction walking around on two legs. Our ancestors dreamed us up and then bent reality to create us. Black, indigenous, and people of color have always had to imagine a life for ourselves. Society has tried to tell us repeatedly who we're not allowed to be, and BIPOC everywhere have imagined new realities for themselves. Black, indigenous, and folks of color have experienced centuries of oppression, centuries of being told no, of being told we don't belong, of being told we don't have permission to be human, and yet we're still here. We will continue to be here and continue to dream, imagine, and build towards the kind of liberatory futures we want to be a part of. And if you're a Black, Indigenous, or person of color listening to this, we have always had our imagination and it can't be taken from us. And I'll borrow Jorge's words here, no system or structure of oppression was before imagination. It was already there, already in flight, already in freedom. I'll take one more sip of water. So one example of the type of liberation work already being done by BIPOC is around disrupting conventional citation practices of citing white men. The Cite Black Women campaign was created by Kristen Smith to motivate people and academics in particular to critically examine their citation practices and to consciously begin to cite black women in their work. And I want to share their five guiding principles to encourage you to examine your own citation practices and to share it with your colleagues, your students, your faculty, 
And I want you to encourage you to look beyond your citation practices and imagine how else this project could be embodied. To first read Black women's work, integrate Black women into the core of your syllabus in life and in the classroom, acknowledge Black women's intellectual production, make space for Black women to speak, and give Black women the space and time to breathe. So BIPOC knowledge is needed and necessary, but it is up to us to offer it up. After years of being told our experience isn't valid or important, white folks can't expect us to then give away our hard-won knowledge for free. It is crucial for the white spaces where we have been made to feel unvalued, unsafe, and unnecessary to fundamentally change in order for this to happen. It's not up to Black, Indigenous, and people of color to change, to shave off pieces of ourselves to fit into these little white spaces. How many more times will you allow a Black Indigenous person of color to be ignored or our concerns rejected or our experiences invalidated? There are many liberatory projects always already in motion by BIPOC. And to the white folks who want to be in solidarity with those projects, let me borrow the words of education scholar David Stovall. You have agreed to something that will challenge you in the support of it. And at some point, you have to get out of the way of the people committed to doing that work. You have to ask yourself, is what I'm doing helpful or is it actually harming the very folks I'm trying to support? And I know this particular audience is filled with folks who adhere to critical librarianship and pedagogy. So I'll give you a few questions to consider. What would it look like for you to not just theorize giving up power, but to actually do it? What would it look like for you to give your power to BIPOC? What would it look like for LIS to give up power to Black, Indigenous, and communities of color to allow them to lead us? What will we all gain when this happens? I can only tell you what I know. We will gain so much clarity, care, and community we will gain the insight, wisdom, and joy necessary for liberatory imaginings, and we will gain the knowledge futures we all deserve. Thank you. And as a reminder, I'm going to prioritize questions from BIPOC in the Q&A. Um, so don't forget to indicate that. And I think we're gonna also record the q and I'll wait for Nicole to confirm that. Yeah, it's gonna keep recording, I think this, just started oh, okay. automatically recording when we came right. in, so yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, I, I'm keeping an eye on the Q&A too, so um, feel free to, to put those in and Sophia will answer. I'll suggest ones for her to ask, I mean to answer. We have a few questions. I know, Sophia, um, you wanted to do stacking. Um, should I just ask you these until we get more? Um, they're both, uh, well, one identifies as Caucasian. I'm not sure the other one. Um, yeah, well, let's just give it a couple more minutes and then I'll, I can jump in when, if I don't see anything else. Okay, sure. Thanks. Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Um, okay, so Isabel's question is, Sophia, how would you answer that last set of questions? So I'm on that slide now. Um, so what would it look like for you to theorize? Yes, so giving up power. I guess for me, 
I would say that white people honestly just need to get out of the way, right? There are also like a more concrete example of this is there are also some jobs that are just not for white folks. So if you work in a um, institution that happens to serve um, people of color, then you might think to yourself, do I really need to work here? Is this position really for me? Um, and when I think about other positions that say like, oh, you know, like for example, there are a lot of archivist positions that are meant to um, look over and work with communities of color and like their knowledge and their archives, I would say then if you don't belong to those communities, you probably shouldn't apply for that job. And if you're on the hiring committee, you should really only be looking for people from those communities to be um, in those positions. That was just one example, but I'm sure other people have other thoughts. Oh, I see there are more questions. So. So Eric said, for me, what is more effective at this moment, reforming establishment organizations or forming parallel ones led by BIPOC, especially BIPOC women? Yeah, good question. Well, Eric, I would say that I am very cynical at this point. And I mean, that's partially why I don't work at an institution anymore um, and trying to move towards creating our own spaces where we're in the lead. Um, I thought that maybe there was a place and you know, maybe I still, I'm still going back and forth on this, that there is a place of changing things from the inside. But um, I guess I've hit myself up against that wall so many times and then have nothing change and maybe potentially get worse to feel like, okay, well, do I really want to be doing this anymore? Is it really worth my time and energy to like keep banging my head against the same wall? Hopefully that answered that question. <laughs> Um, okay, Christina said, how can BIPOC MLIS students disrupt whiteness within our academic experiences, especially as it functions covertly in digital learning and working environments? <sighs> yeah, I think that can be difficult, um, particularly as a student where you often don't have much um, power. But if you, I guess the way that I would say it is to organize with your other students, right? Like. There's power in numbers, and can you know working with your um, your white colleagues as well. I think you know getting. I think I saw an example of this actually on a Facebook group I'm in because I went to the University of Washington. But like getting folks to boycott classes if you know you don't agree with something, or um, I'm. I guess what I'm saying is is to really organize within the student group itself, right? That's where you have the most power. And then I think it's up to you to determine what's best for you and the rest of the group. Okay, someone anonymous said, how do I suggest administrators and leadership support the mental wellness of staff? Great question. I don't know that I'm the one who can answer that, but um, I would say that I think it's, uh, I think it can be difficult, right? Like, does your leadership and administrator actually listen to your staff? Do they think of your staff as people and human? Do they care? Because oftentimes, at least in my experience, like we're seen as replaceable, right? Like there's someone, there's like so many people looking for jobs. And they could have someone else take our place easily is kind of the mindset that I feel like they have. And maybe I shouldn't just put that on everybody who's an administrator and a leader, but um, I would also point out like that the things happening out in the world, just because they're outside in the world doesn't mean they don't also come to work with us. And we have to think about how that impacts our staff's well-being in the workplace and what we're asking them to do, because oftentimes um, it's forgotten because, oh, we urgently have some project that needs to get done, but like also we don't save lives. So let's like not, you know, get ahead of ourselves of what we actually do. Um, okay. Mario says, how can scholarly writing be used as a resistance against, 
white supremacy and LIS approaching such work with I'm angry, let me yell at injustice energy. Yeah, um, I think that's what I'm trying to do in the writing that I've done in the past and what we're trying to do with this book. Um, I think like the more work we're, that BIPOC are able to put out and sharing our thoughts and our knowledge and what we know to be true, um, you know, I think after a while it becomes hard to ignore um, that there, that this work is necessary and that actually, you know, in working on this talk, I found a lot of healing in it. Um, and I think that that is something that scholarly writing could also be used as. It's like not just resistance, but also healing work. Okay. Someone said, do you believe that white people should serve on DEI committees? Yes. <laughs> I mean, I think they should, but they shouldn't maybe always be led by them. I think they should also be accountable to people of color in that organization. Um, if you're gonna serve on that committee, like who are you there to serve? If you're just gonna serve the institutional policies of like, and, and you know, uphold white supremacy, then I don't know, what's the point? Um, okay. Let's see, I'm sorry, I'm going through these kind of fast, I realized. Um, okay, let's see you said. A few years ago, an LIS program was conducting a faculty search and all of the final candidates were white. The BIPOC faculty member I had asked said that they had not received any applications from BIPOC with doctorates. This seemed questionable to me. How would you have pushed back on this? Hmm. I think that's a little difficult if you're not on the search committee yourself. Um, I think the other way you could do it is if you know I mean, I mean, like, what can you say to that? You know, like you could point out that, oh, there's all these other BIPOC folks who have doctorates who would be perfect for this position. But unless you know whether they applied for sure, um, I, think, I think the other thing you could look at is like, what are the HR policies um, stated for that program? Like, do they say like, cause I know some programs actually say like, oh, you have to have at least like one person of color in the um, pool or something like that. Like they have like some, um, I've now forgotten what that word is where you have to have a certain number of people in it. Um, but I think you know what I'm saying. Uh, oh, the implication that their hands were tied. Sorry, I just saw the rest of that. Yeah, I think it's really difficult unless you are in a position of power to really do much about it. Um, I think, I think where you could try to shape things is at the beginning of the search, like when the search is even going to be launched, like if you know that that's gonna happen, there are things that maybe you could be organizing with your fellow colleagues on how to change what the faculty search looks like. Okay. Someone said, I just started my MLIS program and noticed how white the curriculum is white men, white scholars, white authors, how can you audit your course syllabus and raise it to your professor and actually have impact? I think that there are tools out there for auditing course syllabi. Um, I mean, how do you raise it to your professor? That's always a good question. Um, and actually have impact. Again, I think this goes back to organizing with your fellow students and seeing if you can get any traction with all of them and getting them to, as a group, raise it to your professor and say like, hey, this is a problem. And, um, you know, what can we do differently? And like, actually, I mean, honestly, you're probably gonna have to tell them the answer. So you just have that ready. Sip of water. For us BIPOC folks who are given the opportunity to step up, how do you recommend the role of educator and the taxing process of doing the work in libraries at PWIs, especially as it relates to diversity work in libraries? 
Uh, yeah, actually, Jen Brown and I wrote a chapter on this <laughs> in the Pushing the Margins book edited by Annie Fa and Rose Cho. So you could look into that. Um, but I think it's really a choice, right? Like if you want to put in that time and energy, then sure, go for it. Just know that it's going to be really draining and you're going to burn out much faster than if you didn't do that work. But I know the feeling of at the same time, well, if I don't do it, then who's going to do it? Or they're just going to mess it up anyway. Um, so it's really a choice for you, but just know that you will burn out much faster if you do it. Jamie says, the term white supremacy is so alienating to many white people who could benefit from listening and learning. I tend to avoid this term when speaking with white audiences, which I also realize caters to white fragility, another alienating term. Language is so powerful and, create con and can create connection or disconnection. How to reach those who don't see themselves as part of that problem when they will have a negative gut reaction to those terms and refuse to listen because of them? Or is it the point of this terminology to be extremely challenging from the beginning? Um, it's only challenging because it challenges power, right? Um, and of course, it's alienating to many white folks. Yes, I have experienced this too, uh, because it makes them feel like we're accusing them of something. Um, and I guess like what I should say also is like white supremacy is not just in upheld by white folks, right? We can also be the ones doing it as well um, because it's a ideology. It's something that BIPOC can also be inundated with and after a while you have internalized um, all the things white supremacy wanted you to. Um, so it's, I think that it is important to use the right words to describe what is happening um, I guess, it, I mean, for me, I just decided, you know what, there's no way around it. You're just gonna have to deal with it. You're an adult. Um, and just warn them ahead of time that they're gonna have feelings about it. Okay. I often see my white colleagues and also Nicole, if we're running out of time, just let me know. Um, I often see my white colleagues choosing to do EDI related work and choosing to only work with white collaborators. How should or how could or should BIPOC librarians and or librarianship push back against this? Well, first of all, if that's happening, I guess it depends on like what the context is, right? But if I was going to a conference and I saw like, oh, here is a, a title of a talk and an abstract that sounds like, oh, it'd be good because it's EDI related and that's what I care about. And then if I look at who is speaking and it's only white people, then I just won't attend. And I mean, like just not attending the ones that are only going to be like white people working on it. I think that's one way to do it. Um, again, I'm, I'm going back to the organizing thing. Um, organizing your other colleagues to say like, is this really what we want to be doing? Um, and if you look at the example of the surge, which I'm like forgetting what it stands for, but it's basically like white people or racial justice um, is they, it's mostly about white people doing the work, but then being accountable to people of color for the work they've done. So who, like the question is always like, who is this work serving? Is it just for me to look good so that I can pat myself on the back and say that I'm a good white person? And if that's the case, then that's not really the work, is it? Someone said, one of my admin is POC, and he does everything he can to silence POC, particularly Black women. How can I get through to him that he is working against the cause? Hmm. Yeah, that's hard, because that's one of the examples of, you know, white supremacy got to him, and he um, is doing everything he can to be a good a good little person of color and everything that you know white supremacy wants him to be and then also policing other um, black people and people of color. Um, I don't know, you know, like that one's hard because if he wanted to unlearn some of these things, he probably would have already. I think it's like waiting to see if there's an opportunity 
um, where you can approach it in a, I don't want to say like sideways way, but you know, like, just like kind of be like, hmm, like you say, like, unless he's also someone who like proclaims to be, uh, you know, someone who's trying to uplift black women's voices, then you'd be like, well, you're really not doing that, are you? Um, but yeah, you know, trying to maybe see if there's a conversational opportunity, but that's really difficult and I'm sorry. Uh, Sophia, so we're at 115. If you would like to go all the way to 130, um, that's your choice. We added some extra time in for Christian. Um, if you're getting oh, okay. tired or you want to end, it's totally up to you. So I just thought I'd put it out there that if you do want to go all the way, there's only 15 minutes left or you can wrap it up. Yeah, I'll just see if there are any more questions um, from BIPOC and I'll try to finish those up in the time we have. Um, okay, someone said, I've run into the problem of being a minority, minority person. My minority group is less represented than the other minority groups. I support all my minority librarians, but sometimes they don't want to support me. It's sad. Any suggestions? <sighs> yeah. Well, first, I would say stop using the word minority because you're not one. Um, I, I don't like that term just because I think it minimizes, again, and dehumanizes people. Um, and I would say that this is more of a case of solidarity. And I guess you should say like, what are you not being represented in? Or like, what are they not supporting you in? Because oftentimes it's like, what I've found is that I've had to, you know, like we've all had our damage, right? Like racism divides us, white supremacy wants us to think like we're all in it as individuals or that, you know, each racial group is only there for themselves. And so the whole point of that is to say, well, that is not what I'm going to do. I'm going to support those groups, whether or not they support me. Um, and then like, you know, hopefully by modeling what the work should look like, that would then allow more solidarity between you and these other folks. But I am sorry that they don't want to support you because that really sucks. Um, okay. So someone asked me, would you be willing to share more about your personal journey in this work? I appreciate you sharing how you are cynical. What gives you life to still engage in the field in your current way? Um, I think that having community, like I still, it's not like that I hate libraries and archives or that I hate LIS. Um, is that I know how powerful LIS is and how powerful libraries and archives can be and what they could do instead. Um, and so like, I still care about what happens in the field and most of my community is in this field. So those are the folks that keep me going. And um, like this work is important to me. So that's why I'm still here, <laughs> despite how much it wants me to leave. Okay, uh, for someone new to writing with a crit lib framework, how can you provide guidance on any pitfalls to applying the framework incorrectly? Sure, well, I don't actually write with a crit lib framework. Um, I write with a critical race theory framework. I don't know about pitfalls. I think like you're gonna make mistakes, right? Like I've, I'm sure I've made mistakes in this very talk, but it's just about like always again, relying on community and saying like, hey, someone I trust, can you read this? Or um, looking back um, on your own work and seeing like, okay, is this serving white supremacy? Is this serving racism? Like where, where can I not do that? I think is the question that I usually try to ask myself. I don't know if that's helpful. <laughs> I hope that it is. Okay. I think this is the last BIPOC question for now. Um, okay, if you're willing to share, what kind of advice do you have for BIPOC who are currently considering leaving toxic workplaces and the profession? Yeah, I mean, that's a real question. Um, I think you have to do what's best for you, right? That's your your choice um, and that it's really how much more can you stand of it 
And I've heard other other people have really good situations, right? And that there are good situations out there in libraries. Um, I'm not sure that I've experienced them, but I think it's it's really like what you can stand and how much you want to be in this profession and whether it's worth your mental health and your physical health um, and your emotional safety to continue to be in that position. Um, I think unfortunately there are a lot of toxic workplaces in this profession and I'm not sure I think like, you know, reaching out to your community and finding out if there are places that you want to work that don't have um, as much toxicity. I don't know. I, a lot of the question is also like, how much are you willing to tolerate or like, what is, what are you willing to tolerate? Because I think different places will have, you know, the pros and cons of different things that you might have to tolerate. Whew. Okay, I think I <laughs> answered all of those questions. Okay, I'm gonna start from the top and now work my way down again for the ones I didn't answer initially. Okay, Kelly said, if there is time, can you talk about the founding of LIS more and how it is tied to white supremacy and why the science part was added? I haven't heard about this before, thanks. Well, honestly, I haven't really gotten into how um, LIS was founded. I think, um, well, actually, Mirna and Stacy's chapter in the book that's coming out next year, they're going to cover some of this um, in their, when they talk about epistemic supremacy. Um, I think Bobazi, Jenny, and Anastasia's chapter will also cover some of this, but it's, I mean, I don't know why they picked science. I'm, I was just, you know, asking my own questions about why is our field considered a science? Um, <laughs> it doesn't strike me as being a science. I don't know if for you, Kelly, it does. So that's something you might do. Um, there's also a lot of research that I've um, cited in my resources. So you could take a look at that. Okay. Um, Paige said, do you have thoughts about how we can include and get more BIPOC involved in LIS programs and librarianship in general? And how do we go down about breaking these exclusive structures? <sighs> That's a big question, Paige. Um, I guess the question is, do we want to be involved in LIS programs and librarianship? I mean, considering the way we've been treated and how hard we have to work to get into the profession. And then once we're in the profession, we're then asked, oh, are you a diversity hire? Did you get in here because you're not white? Um, you know, those kinds of questions would be helpful to not being asked. I think a lot of it is cultural, like, you know, if you look up, um, if you just Google white supremacy culture characteristics, you'll see there's a lot of characteristics in there. And um, a lot of those are inherent in librarianship and in LIS. Uh, so there's a lot of work to be done. I mean, also there are issues of like, well, if we're asking people for a master's degree, how are we, how are they going to pay for those degrees? Um, and how can we support BIPOC um, in doing those programs. Oh, and actually also April, Isabel, and Maria have a chapter on this as well <laughs> in the book. So basically the book is going to answer all these questions. Okay, another. How can we reconcile the notion of giving up power when often the folks with the most power are not the ones engaging in these conversations? Yeah, great question. How do the folks at the bottom ask the folks at the top, often in white men, to consider giving up power and get out of the way? Sorry, I'm going to take a quick sip. Yeah, great question, Allison. Um, sometimes I don't know. I think like, I think it goes back again to what I've said in response to a few other questions about organizing and um, the fact that there are a lot of us who feel this way and if we can band together and say like, this is wrong and we want things to change, that's one way of doing it. Um, I think it's hard. I think sometimes you gotta wait for retirements. <laughs> okay. Hi, Violet. Violet asked, 
Do you have suggestions for media that would help people stretch their imagination about what is possible in society? Yes. Um, some of them are in my resources slide deck, the last three slides on here um, that I'll share. And then podcasts, I would say Pod Save the People. I'm going to draw some blanks because I'm getting tired, but um, Strictly Processing. I'm still naming podcasts because that's all I really listen to. Um, really any podcasts that are hosted by Black, Indigenous, and people of color. There's a bunch of Indigenous podcasts. Um, and there's also um, the podcast called, I think it's like the, hmm, the End of the World. Wait, well, it's an Adrian Marie Brown. Any work by Adrian Marie Brown is very inspirational. Um, and sorry, I'm gonna have to end that answering that question now because my brain has stopped working. Um, Lisa said, do you see a role for reparations in librarianship? I mean, sure, like going back to what I said either in the talk or in answer to a question, um, that I think white folks need to give up power in which case that means either giving up positions of power in um, you know, our organizations like ALA or um, whether that's also like actual jobs. Um, and then if you, you know, are on hiring committees, what could reparations look like there? I think there are a lot of places that um, librarianship could benefit from reparations, but again, my brain is now on the, the end of its <laughs> it's last legs. Okay. Um, okay, someone said, well, the addition of more own voices works in collections assist. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely one of the ways that that would um, that would change things. Um, but also looking at how we promote and talk about those collections um, and how you know, even when we're doing collections work, the statistics that we look at, like, are those really the ones we want to look at um, when we're selecting what to keep and what to throw away? Um, I mean, I think there's a lot that could be done in collections. Okay. Megan said, how can teaching incorporate indigenous experience into conversations surrounding evaluating information and who is considered an expert when it comes to scholarly sources? Okay, so first I'll say I'm not indigenous, so I cannot answer this question. Um, this is a question that, again, it's about building relationships with the indigenous folks in wherever the lands are that you live and asking them, like not just asking them, but also like showing up for them because you can't just expect them to give this answer to you for free. Um, maybe they're really generous and they will, but you know, how are you going to show up for them before you ask them for things? Okay. Someone wrote, an anonymous person said, oh, we have two minutes, so this is probably the last question. I've gotten a lot of excuses like, BIPOC do not normally apply for our job postings, and when they do, they do not accept the position. And we cannot use state funds to fund diversity interns. No, you shouldn't have diversity interns. What is the best way, in your opinion, to get administrators on board to really commit to hire and retain BIPOC at a primarily white and white lit institution? I don't know that there's a best way. Um, oh, actually, what was I listening to the other day? Someone was, oh, I think I was listening to um, Couples Therapy, which is a fun podcast um, with comedians. But uh, one of the comedians happens to be a black woman and they were talking with another black woman comedian about how, you know, if you hire a person of color onto a writing team for like a TV show or something that you should be hiring at least two. So that <laughs> when the one black person is like uh, this, you know, something's wrong about this and we should really uh, think again about, you know, having a character say that, for example then you could turn to the other person of color in the room and be like, um, don't you agree? But I think it's like bigger than that, right? Because if I was interviewing in a position, and I think this is also, again, 
an individual decision of like whether you're going to take a job or not. But are there other faces of color in the audience when I give my presentation, like if it's an academic place or like if I look at the staff photos, is it just like all the same and I, you know, I'm just going to be an only? That's not really going to do much. Um, and then what are the policies in place? Are they only representing um, what white folks care about? I mean, like there are a lot of different ways to change this. Okay, we're at 4.30, so I don't want to go over my time. Thank you so much, Sophia. This was excellent. And I really, I'm so glad that there's been so much interaction in the chat. Um, so everyone knows, since there is so much there, the chat is saved when um, a webinar is recorded. So all of this will be there, including the intro slides. I had some people asking uh, for those as well. So um, we have all that. And um, yeah, contact Sophia at where she has up on here um, if you want to get in touch with her. Um, I posted a link to our happy hour after here. It's going to go for the next 30 minutes. Um, it's really chill, just fun uh, way to meet other people coming to the conference and hang out. Um, so if you'd like to go, it's on our website. I'll post the link one more time in the chat. And thanks everyone so much for coming. And we look forward to seeing you throughout the conference. Okay, Sophie, I think we're safe to uh, log out and then the recording will stop. Okay, sounds good. Thanks, right. Nicole. Yeah, thanks again so much. That was excellent. Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye.